evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You're very welcome this evening to Shiloh Christian Fellowship's Testimony Night. Every other week, we're holding testimonies. And tonight, we're delighted to have again Tommy Roundtree and Stephen Paul. We've heard Tommy before, and we've heard Thomas, more affectionately known as Boneyard. In fact, the last time these men were here, they left. And then Boneyard got COVID, uh, COVID and almost died. Yeah. But you see, he's here tonight because God had a plan. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you here, and we're looking forward to you hearing your testimony as well. So, um, what we're going to do tonight, we've changed things just slightly. We're going to be standing, after I pray, we'll be standing to sing just two songs to give more time uh, for the men to give their testimonies. Uh, and then, once they've done. Uh, Boneyard will introduce them, Thomas will introduce them. Then when they're both done, I will speak briefly uh, from God's word, and it will be brief. And then uh, we'll finish with one song, and then there's tea and coffee. So please stay and chat with people um, afterwards. Again, just to let people know in advance that the next testimony night is Rocky Davison. And Rocky will be giving his testimony on Sunday, the 1st of May. Now, we know what he's like. So, what's that? Yeah, so it's going, it'll be going through until Monday night. Uh, that's why we're doing it as an interview. <laughs> I'm interviewing, and if he keeps talking, we'll just switch it off. So, <laughs> anyway, that's, that, that's the announcements for this evening. Thank you very much to everyone who has come along. Thank you to those who are watching in on Facebook and on YouTube. And we hope that you also enjoy just the, uh, the atmosphere that we're experiencing here tonight. But, you know, it's all about Jesus. And this is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And because of Jesus, we have life forevermore. And we want to celebrate that truth tonight. So let's just pray and give thanks unto the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you this evening that we have gathered again in this place. Others are gathering, Lord, in, in their homes, watching in on Facebook and on YouTube to hear the testimony of these men of how you and your grace have saved them through faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. On this Resurrection Sunday, we thank you that Jesus is still in the soul-saving business. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the full salvation that you give to anyone who will repent of their sins and put their trust yeah. in you. Lord, you're a wonderful Savior, and it's our delight to know you and to love you yeah. and to tell forth of the wonders of your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for these men tonight. And we pray that the spirit of the living God would rest upon them. And that they, Lord God, would be blessed as we indeed believe we will be blessed in hearing what they have to share tonight. Lord, you are a good God. And we thank you that in this day and age, Lord, when we look at this world and all that's going on in this world. And everything is pointing to the imminent return of Jesus. We thank you that you're still interested in the lost yes. soul. That you're still interested, Lord, in reaching out to sinners. That you might save them by your grace. And bring them, Lord God, into your kingdom. Adopting them into your family. Through faith in Jesus Christ, your son. Lord, tonight, may the power of God be manifested in this place. May the spirit of the living God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead be at work in this place tonight. Yes. And may souls be saved Amen. according to the riches yes. of your grace in yes. Jesus' name. Lord, we want to take this moment now to sing these two songs of praise to your holy name. Lord, may it resound from this place into the heavenlies as we declare that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, as Jesus Christ is a risen, conquering king. We bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen.
uh, came from a family of six, four brothers, one sister. Uh, I have three children myself, six grandchildren. Say, I was born to Shangal, uh, and lived in, growing up, I lived in Sugarfield Street. It was just right beside the peace line there. Um, things, things that we sort of done growing up, uh, especially at the start of troubles and stuff, was we were always around at the, the peace floor. We were always ratting and all, getting into trouble around there. And there's one particular story that always stands out for me. At the, at the Peace Wall, um, there was a bit of it was corrugated iron, big concrete ballards and steel poles, one at our end and one at the other end. But there was a gap in it, and we used to get through the gap and go up to the top of the street and the other end, run down, break all the windows, and get back out again. So we were in the back of Hollow Street one day, not far from the Peace Wall, but there was a gate. There was a gate up the, uh, the very top of it, and there was these two, we didn't see anybody coming out the gates or anything, but there was these two guys walking down, and we started shouting, did you see a wee dog about? I said, no, mister, I didn't see any dog, so we started getting closer. Did you see a wee dog about anywhere? And I says, no. And next one he hit me a big thing with me. He says, see the next time I see you in there for the devil, this end will break your jaw. <laughs> so as you can imagine, I've never been through it again. I sort of learned my lesson from it. Um, so we looked at Sugar Face Street there as well. We were all every wee terraced houses back then. Uh, there were only two up, two down houses. And it was just me and my brother at the time. So my mum and dad, I worked about Eight years old, they'd got a house down the Shankill Estate. The Shankill Estate was just built at the time, and uh, they'd got a house down the Shankill Estate. And we had moved down, it was a three bedroom house, so we moved in the Malvern Way, just behind the courthouse in the Crumlin Road. And we had uh, two brothers, and we ended up with our roommates from all back and front garden, with no garden or nothing, uh, when we lived in Sugarfree Street. But Within the space of seven years, there was six of us. Had no four brothers and one sister. So you imagine that. It was all, all the boys in one room. So I was come back and forward, uh, living with my grandmother and my grandfather up in Sugarfield Street. Um, well, just with I'm never worried about primary school, uh, just finishing primary school was uh, just another story that stood out for me. Was uh, Herbie McCollum had went there, we were just finished for, we had just finished school uh, for the summer before I was going to secondary school, and Herbie McCollum had just come down the street and he had been to this tattoo or something, done tattoos up in the, the old park, Julian Carson, I think he called them at the time, and uh, he was doing tattoos, Herbie came down this tattoo. Now Herbie's about five, six years older than us at the time. And he says, I want a tattoo. And he says, there's no way my mum and daddy will let me get a tattoo. So he says, I know what I'll do, I'll go and ask my granny. <laughs> so I went and my granny says, my granny, Herbie's just got a tattoo. I want to get one for starting secondary school. So, here she was, no, you need to go and ask your mum and dad. I says, they won't let me. She said, right, come on, I'll take you up. <laughs> so away we went up the old park, walking up the old park, and uh, we get the tattoos, and I get in and started picking out what I wanted. I picked out this wee man United, the wee devil from the man United bands. Mm. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's never put me in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I picked out, I picked out this, um, we think that well, once he turned the machine on, I started to panic. Because I was only 11 or something, and uh, I says, oh, I don't want to get this now. She says, I'll get one first. And she hadn't had any tattoos or anything. She said, I says, well, what are, you, what are you going to get? She says, I'm going to get the UDA badge. <laughs> so, my granny had got the UDA badge on her arm. It was the only tattoo she ever had. <laughs> So it was, and then I got mine after her because I seen her getting it and made me brave enough to get the tattoo. So 
She's still got the ADA badge right up until she just passed, she just passed her uh, two weeks ago. And it's a sad time. Uh, spent three days in the hospital, with her in the hospital, in, in the matter hospital. And it was the, it was on the Saturday she passed um, that I was to give my testimony for the first time on the Sunday. But I went ahead with it sort of a, a bit and for her and her memory as well because without me getting to the Lord, I may have brought me to the Lord about two months before she passed. So if I hadn't been saved, my grandmother probably wouldn't get saved either. So and but you say God's timing for things was his perfect timing because she was just she had no quality of life just lying there and I knew doing my testimony for the first time she wouldn't have got to see me doing it. So he took her on the Saturday for me doing it on the Sunday. So she's the, she had the best seat in the house. Uh, so just more, I just because I'm trying to put a couple of wee things in just about my granny as well in her memory as well, obviously. And we'd always went away on holiday to our holidays back then. I wasn't getting away to Spain and all that there. It was Blackpool. And um, when we went with all the old folk, we went all these coach things. We were all young and uh, around seeing the room masons and all that there. But the, one of the years we went, um, she had these brochures out. This was a new hotel where we were trying over there. And, Everything looked amazing, and when we got there, we thought we were actually in the wrong. We thought we went to the wrong hotel, and looking around, and the place was an absolute thunder end. But nothing like the brochure. But it was only when, um, when we actually got home again from it that we found out the two guys who were owned it were only out of prison. So they must have got somebody to make these brochures up for them to sell the, to sell the holiday. But the, the thing about it, the first first night there. Uh, we get up the next morning, get our breakfast. Nick Bonds, it was hardly a night, it wasn't cuddly or things like that. There, so um, me and my cousin and my brother was there, and she came in. She sent me my breakfast down. It was in a pool you go to the toilet in. <laughs> uh, I just started crying, I just wanted to go home. That's a kind of, that's a kind of thing. Um, I just, uh, just wanted to put that in, just so I get my grandmother. Um, uh, just get this bit here, we're we'll just moving on because it's the same time. The last time I done this two weeks ago, he says tram fell half an hour. And the first time I looked at my watch, I was talking for 45 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and it's still about five, four or five pages to get through. <laughs> so I'm just trying to be aware of the time as well. Uh, my, daughter, uh, my daughter Stephanie was born. In 1982, um, it was an opportunity for me to sort of get out of the house then. I started, I got my own house and living down the lower shangle. Um, but I'd always been involved with like youth work and stuff growing up and around the hammer, in the hammer and the summer schemes and things like that there. Bernardo's after school clubs, I was trying to keep myself involved and meet things in the community from a young age. And Everybody remembers when you the summer scheme, the last trip, everybody goes away, uh, say like Port Rice or something like that there. So the Howard went away that year to Port Rice. I wasn't there. My brothers all had been away on this trip and I remember this whole commotion looking back and I seen, I seen two police officers going uh, to my mum and dad's house. So I had gone up the street, my dad was chalk white, my mum was screaming. Um, what happened was they were coming home from that trip and they'd stopped on the carriage way and my brother, all the kids were good, he was only nine at the time and all the kids get off the bus and he ran out in front of the bus across the road. He got hit by a car, uh, there was a trailer on, landed behind the trailer, trailing the whole way down the road and he actually he actually died at the scene and uh, two nurses, this is my father. Oh. There was two nurses coming back from a wedding, just a 
and just just in the nick of time because they were able to do uh, they were able to get them round again they were uh, doing the CPR and stuff on them they were able to work with them and they got them round again so the, the ambulance that came anyway and they rushed them to one of the local hospitals close to where it was but they ended up having to move to the Royal where he died again on the way uh, so he, he's, he's in hospital he, Nearly all the bones in his body broke. It was uh, really bad brain damage and stuff, uh, head injuries. Um, he was, they put him on the, obviously, life support and things they like got there, but the doctors didn't give him any hope. They just says that they asked my mum to turn the life support off and, and she insisted no. But my uncle, my mum's uncle Eddie, Eddie McGill, uh, is well known to Shangle, uh, a follower of God. Had been up constantly praying with them, and after a number of months, Brian actually came around again and came out of the coma. But the, the hard thing about it, even though it, it came back to us again, was he had no me memory whatsoever of the accident, what happened to him, and he had no memory of his family. He didn't know anybody. It was really hard uh, for my mum at the time because. He just thought she, she was a nurse um, the whole time in the hospital and uh, while, while, he was, sort of, while he was in the hospital and stuff uh, he, just, he just didn't recognise them, he didn't know anybody and the only thing about it that, that I regret my mum were doing was at, at that time was she used to put the earphones on, back then it was the cassette players and used to put the earphones on, let him listen to music. Dolly Parton's out. <laughs> He's obsessed with Dolly Parton. He runs a Dolly Parton fan club. He has all these, he has all these Dolly Parton all over his room. Do you know, he's just obsessed with Dolly Parton now. Um, but so, anyway, I went on anyway, and I uh, yeah, got out, out of hospital and stuff, and I uh, was in wheelchair and stuff for a long time and stuff. Uh, but uh, my, my dad had, my dad was involved in drugs. My dad was a uh, Rosie Paul. Um, my dad was involved in drugs and he'd get put out of his home where they lived in the Shankill and he, he, they ended up they moved to, to Bangor. The, the rest of us stayed except for the four younger so then they had moved the banger with him. Now, while they, while they were down living in the banger, my dad had stopped drinking and, and all that there. Uh, where, when he was living where he was up in the shangle, was obviously drinking and stuff all the time. He'd stopped drinking and stuff when they were out. So everything seemed to be a, a, good, a good move for them when they moved down there. And, uh, they were get, got the, the back of the house and all sorted out for Ryan. Uh, they had to be adopted obviously for the wheelchair and stuff and things they got there. So, so they moved down there. Um, same way, not long after they were down there, and I uh, had Marie Joanne, um, my wife and I, we, we had actually met in school. Marie, 25 years, a student, uh, been together for 33. Uh, I met oh, my wife Joanne and say so we get married on 14th of June 1997. It's 10th of April 1998 and good sign a good Friday agreement. My son was born, Daryl. And in between that time there was an attempt on my, my dad's uh, brother's life and the man was responsible, my dad actually went into him down in Bangor in one of the, the shopping centres and there was an altercation then and uh, later that there, 1998, um, 3rd of July 1998, um, I was at home and got this phone call early in the morning and it's something that's odd. It actually played a big part in sort of my own mental health and things going through life because 
I got this phone call and it was my mum. And I've never heard my mum crying like this before. And she said, your dad's just been murdered. Your dad's been shot dead. And it's, it was one of those phone calls and it was like, kind of just stopped. And I just wanted to get to her, get down there and, uh, but that phone call just, even now I still get it. Number of times where it's, do you ever get something where it's recorded and you can't delete it? That's, that's what it's like. It's, it's just, can't, it just comes back all the time and, and has an effect on you. Uh, so, but down anyway, and I uh, seen my, my dad's body on the, the side of his car and just through the police court and stuff and uh, get into where my mum was and stuff. But uh, it was a real hard time for the whole family after that and really hard to deal with. And, I had sort of went down a road and even before that had happened where I had been taking drugs, out partying and <coughs> just it was just when we were the circles we were all about in that that's the things that we were doing and you, you had no consideration for anybody else but it was just you going out getting that high and doing what you were doing but eventually that girl caught up with me um, there was one time we were, were at a party and somebody came back with stuff which they told us was speed and I had taken it. Uh, it was a couple of spoonfuls or something off it. It was actually stuff for putting horses down. And uh, my lung had collapsed. Uh, I just collapsed in the house. Uh, the next time I woke up, it was, it was in the hospital. Well, where, where I didn't, as I said, she came around. But, it was the first time I only started thinking about fear of a real fear of dying and and actually calling out I don't want to die in, in the God which I didn't know now. I just kept telling my mom, just tell it my wife and my kids I love them and all this here. But after a number of days I come round and fancy get back out of hospital again. But a number of years after that, it just took a real toll on me. My mental health, panic attacks, everything else just started with everything going on in the family, things that had happened within the family, and I'd say that had a real, real effect on me. Uh, so our, our daughter, our daughter was born, uh, the youngest one, on the 26th of June 2006, so a few months and my, uh, my daughter being born, my son was, was a hard for um, He was only about eight or nine at the time. As Bonyard will tell you, he used to be his taxi driver taking him to school. Bonyard. And see the way Bonyard sings, I think he learned from taking him to all the school. Because when Don used to be in the back of a taxi, he was beating him over the heavy overhang <laughs> on the school run. So he stopped to sing, get him to sing songs for to keep him quiet. But there was this time of the year that my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, says, look, we'll take Dara with us down to the car and I'll give you a wee break, because you just have the, ch the chatting stuff in the house. And, and I said, I had the conversation with my wife, and I says, I will not have him down there, because you look at he's like when he's out in the street and all. And she says, should I go to me for a couple of days? So I had a band anyway, weren't down, Four or five hours away, phone. It was brother on. He says the helicopter and everything was up there. He said, I thought he was best mate. He said, Jackie, stop letting me up, will you? I says, What's wrong? He says, Make him down. He says, Darling, you're drowned. I says, What happened? Um, he says, Well, we'll get down to the car one. Him and Nathan went out. We stole two canoes. Went out in the water with the canoes. Uh, no, pad there was no paddles with them, so Daryl started drifting away out, but his canoe had a hole on it. <laughs> so, at like, nine years of age, he always carried a wee bit of weight, and uh, he could not swim for anything. 
and he'd come out of the canoe away out in the water. Uh, my brother and all, nobody could get them, it was that far out. But they ended up, the, the helicopter was up and the, the boat was out, and they ended up, they got a tunnel. And he was in the water for 15 to 20 minutes for a nine year old that couldn't swim. And he says, but what they could see was he kept them under the water and coming up again. And my, at that age, we spoke when I went down, I was able to get down and tell him. Uh, I, I said to him, what happened you know, uh, about being out in the water start? It was only a few days later trying to talk to him about it. He says, Daddy, every time I went under the water, it was like somebody had my feet pushed me back up again. Oh, oh, oh. And to, to me, that was. To me, uh, there was no other explanation for it, only God had his hands on that day. And just a wee verse here, it always stands out to me, Isaiah 42, or Isaiah 43, verse 2. Uh, when you get through deep waters, I will be with you. He was with him that day. I thank the Lord for that. So, Try and speed this up a bit. Just to say, my own mental health wasn't great, and uh, it, after it happened, they started to get these panic attacks and all everything else that was happening. Uh, it, it got to the point where I just didn't want to go on my life. I waited everybody was out of the house that day. The kids were away at school, and, and my wife had gone to work. And that day, I was going to in my life. I just had enough. I didn't, I didn't just want to be here anymore. Uh, There's too much going on and things I couldn't deal with over the years still was affecting me. I just, and as I said there, I heard, I just heard this voice. I heard this voice saying not to do it, but I, I just, I didn't know what the voice was or who it was. I didn't know where it was, my head was just going, I was imagining it. I, I didn't know what it was, and I didn't find out that there until later. So it didn't work for me, medication, nothing, anything like that wasn't working for me, going to counselling, everything I got there, so... Uh, there was a boneyard said there, I started a couple of wee groups up within the community, community first, and um, some group, suicide awareness, mental health, and I said, just to try and help other people, and... Well, this was years later, a few years later, because I'd been in that position myself and I was just wanted to try and help people. And we'd lost two friends to suicide in 2016, and it was one of the reasons we started it up. One of the young lads had actually played football. With. It was just a wee story here, just to try and finish it in this bit here, but. Uh, well, I had this wee group linking people in the different services and stuff and getting the support. I, my son again, he comes up again, and he said to me, could you get me a membership for the gym? And I says, yes, that's no problem, i get you a membership for the gym. But that was a way to work anyway. And got a phone call. Your bigger your girl's just trying to drive your car and he doesn't have a license and we drove in his life. He was going to take the car to the gym and drove it through my wall and next door neighbour's wall. Wrecked the wall, the car was wrecked, had to get the car lifted off, but uh, one of the tow trucks. But it was only when my car was in getting fixed and this is another God moment for me because it was only by my car was in getting fixed and if that never happened, I wouldn't have walked. I, I was planning to walk down to football that day and walked down the hill. I was heading down to Balligo and something kept saying to me, turn, turn. And I ended up just turning. I mean, I turned my back and started walking up away to get the bus. There was a young man sitting at the bus stop, sat down beside him. I uh, didn't know him now. Uh, and he said to me, I was actually going to message you because he knew you had, he must have knew I had to be group and stuff. He says, I was going to message you about a week ago, but I couldn't build up a crazy to do it. So we got on the bus together and we started talking on the way down. 
Nou, ik heb de diarree voor het zonbuur onder waar een steen heet en stof. Maar dat was eigenlijk dat ik nog wat de school is zelf. Ik was dus trying to talk to him and encourage him to come down and get some help and support. But it wasn't sort of until a year later that uh, he had given his life to the Lord. A year later, and he sort of told his story. And he, he talked about the bus stop. He says, there was a guardian angel sent to me that day. He says, because that's the day I was going there in my life. I say, so my car getting wrecked, me walking down, everybody knows me, I always walk everywhere. If I'm out walking, I'll go where I'm going. I would never, I'd probably count one hand many times I've been on a bus. But something made me turn that day to get the bus. I believe it was God. Yeah. 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 So just come to the end of it now. Uh, I started doing these wee walks, this is how I sort of came to God. Uh, I started doing these wee walks for the Northern Ireland Children's Hospice in June time and I was going through it because of something that happened uh, at the early part of that year in January. Uh, I was starting to get into that sort of depression and stuff again and not feeling great and stuff. And, so my mate, they always knows there's something like that wrong. He said, Mom will do a sweet thing for the children's hospice and raise some money. But on these walks, we're doing a hundred mile challenge. And during these walks, Boneyard and a few other ones would start bumping in the ambulance. And while we were out, they were out walking. And sort of, we and we started going out together. We started actually, after we'd done the wee challenge and stuff, we still continued doing the wee walks and we'd been out walking. And Boneyard said to me, why don't you come down to church one day to meet my mate? And I says, well, I'll, I'll take you up in the offer now. And uh, like I said, Tommy and Bonyard, when they done their testimonies and stuff in the coming OGL in 2018 and mm. all, other things within church. And I always, I always believed in God, but it just didn't, it didn't really want them know. It, it didn't actually look for them. I just, I just didn't, just didn't want to, I, I believed them, but uh, it was just them doing their walks that we went down and uh, Boneyard said to me about coming down, so I went down and we'd go for a few weeks and I was really, it was, was really enjoying it. And, but it was one of the weeks coming down and I just kept saying to myself, what is it, what is it you, you're looking for? I just said, I couldn't get grasp of what, what I was actually looking for him, but obviously the worship songs had just finished and it was the pastor speaking that day and, and probably many of have had this here where you actually think he's speaking to you mm -hmm. yeah. and that's what happened that day uh, it was as if he was only talking to me and he was talking about this song and based on love and uh, uh, and about Jesus wanted a personal relationship with you and all, and everything he said it was something that I was actually searching for. And, he did, and I just thought to myself, this, this is something that I really need in my life. And uh, so he, he got the, the bit where they come to the end of it, and I haven't been in one before, but it's sort of, it apart from the previous two weeks ago, where it said, says pray a simple prayer in your heart. I prayed that prayer that day in my heart and like I've never prayed for anything before. Mm -hmm. I just wanted things to change. And as I say, I was in the 9th of August, Sunday 9th of August uh, 2020, the day I gave my life to the Lord. But then, um, it was a day I planned the end of my life that God saved my life. Oh, so it was. He spoke to me yeah. and he told me not to get through with it. Yeah. Now instead of having the desire to die, I had a reason to live. Yeah. I went from despair and hope and you can too. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not deep, dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
And just to finish in this bit here, this is a message for, for everybody that's sitting here tonight, is someday your spirit will leave your body, just like my grandmother's did. You will take your last breath. You will go to one of two places, mm. heaven or hell. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Bible is your passport. Jesus is your pilot. And heaven is your, de is your destination. Have you asked him into your life? Thank you. Suddenly, and suddenly, 
And suddenly, the little things changed. The police came and took my daddy away one Sunday, one Saturday morning, the old house was crying. My daddy never came back. He got a 10 year sentence for having a gun and shooting that gun during a gun battle between the Shankle and the Falls in 1969. My mummy was left with us five children. My uncle David left three doors away. My mummy's brother, he became my father for helping my mummy. He was 33 years old. Uh, my uncle David and I heard him home one night. <coughs> and the alarm bells were going, my people in those dark old days. It was dangerous to even walk the streets at night. My uncle David was found dead the next day. I had him 15 by then, and he was found dead, body beaten, shot five times in the head. And uh, dumped in the waterworks. Nobody ever was caught for that, but. The coffin had to be closed and all, you know. So this was my baptism of fire into the world. The time I was 17, I was going to come in prison, caught my guns, my three friends, and the proceeds of a, pro, of a post office robber. So from having a great future at the voice model, these things happen, and, you know, you learn the hard way. You know, we make bad choices with bad consequences. But I became full of hatred. We fell into the, the trap, the tribalism, us and them, them and us. Everything was about them and us, us and them. And they fell into the trap, but their trap was Brit Street, Shopy R and I, that's when we stopped. And our trap we fell into was well then no surrender. And that went on, cycle, cycle, cycle. So over the next 20 odd years, I was four times in prison. But twice I was taken to trial and acquitted, found not guilty, and walked out. I spent a bit of time in the prison. But every time I got out, I was straight back to the UVF. Now, time was rolling on, I just wanted to speed up, you know, and I spent my whole life in the UVF. Don't know where I found the time I got married. <laughs> <laughs> And have four children. <laughs> and God forgive me for what I put them through. Because we were in the presence of us. I lived in a house with bulletproof windows. The first one in the shangle I hit them. But I knew I needed them. They were coming. They told me that. To my face in the pool. We get them to get out. But anyway. They nearly got me in a prison one time. The last time I was in was a Santex bomb went off. That is made them remember. In the dining hall where all the loyalists were having their spending a couple of hours and their shower time, television time, and Sam Tex bomb went off behind the radiator. It was like a, a very large uh, company, you know, to tell two of us prisoners, two young, two young men. Uh, Con Cole with them, not Sweet, it was about 30 inches. So, I got out of prison again because I went to trial that time and got out again. Back to the EVF. There was the Hugh Adams talks going on on the political front of it all. On the 16th of June 1994, I was standing talking with three friends in a shank of the road and a shooting took place. Well, I was the first one shot. Uh, in front of me says, Tommy, look out in an emergency. And as I turned to see what he meant, to see this gun, and bang, and I seen the, the bubble of the, the case was in the air. And I ran around the slow motion. I survived that shooting, but my three friends were killed. I got away. Six weeks later, the ceasefires came up in the scene, for, you know, for them, and there was much to live for. And I was, you know, I, therefore, the survivors' guilt and all the all the stuff went along with that, and uh, the heavy drinking came. If I get into the pub and get about seven or drinks in me, I felt okay. I go to doctors, try these tablets, try these tablets. If you try these ones, you have to do a catalog for it. There's new ones, how do you try them? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember walking up the road and I got doctors in the way. I said, see if I beat this one like this. I don't want to make it, are you? I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. He's a probably heard of it. 
Many swear, most of my experience is hard. Oh, <laughs> Being a head of this trauma, and we've always had a trauma, we've all had our traumas. But I had a bad dose of that anyway, and it wasn't nice. But that's how I dealt with it three times. For seven years. Uh, didn't consider, consider myself an alcoholic, <laughs> you know. But an alcoholic's the last person to realize he's an alcoholic. I was alcohol of him for seven years. That's where I became. Still able to function in my family and, and stuff like that and kid myself. Now, the lowest few came along after the ceasefires were called in 1994, and there was a, those in the lowest saying who didn't want to give up their wee drug empires and their wee fiefdoms and their wee whatever they had. And there was those who wanted peace, and there was auction of those. And there was a, started a different country areas, and inevitably it came to Shankill Road, it was always coming, and there was a lowest few. And, uh, I was there when that happened too. So I sat in the house at the end, but that, that's just the way I was. And 15 shot fired at us. So there was a shooting that day, and I was back where that night again. I sort of went away to Port Rush or something. <laughs> but I just got out of my car, looked about 20 yards from it, and a car pulled up beside my car and hose it down with a machine gun. The senior wasn't in it and started dragging the machine gun over. And the guy I was talking to had hit three times. The fella sat there. So here we go again. Get through all of that. But anyway, I came to a point in my life called the pit. The Bible talks about the pit. Anybody who's ever saved and know your word about it. I fell into a place called the pit, the PTSD, the drinking, all the rest of it. I went through a hellish time with myself. And like be a, you know, I know, being here in those now, the devil's real. Mm -hmm. The devil was coming against me, and he's trying to destroy me, and he had me on the run. And in that pit, you know, there was everything in there, every evil thing, shame, guilt, fear, torment, confusion. This went on for 15 months, this didn't go on for a week. This went on for 15 months. I got to that point, the drink wasn't even hitting the mark anymore. I knew I was losing it. I mean, what do you do now? It's no medication. <laughs> it doesn't even do it. But anyway, suicide attempt. That's the way I did. I remember the devil coming to me and saying, I, felt, I, I couldn't tell the difference in between the devil and God. And saying, it would be better for you. Remember Ken? And the bed up the stairs in the family home. The better for you if you were never born. The better for you if you were cast in the, the sea with a millstone around your neck. And you be thinking to the Bible, and I thought that was God. He says, I'm going to scatter your family, scatter your seed, and I knew your seed was your children and your grandchildren. And I'm going to deal with the devil. Take me or leave my family alone. That was a day back then. So I got up and tried to hang myself. Thank God I'm still here. Just the grace of God. But I was found in that condition, you know, and conscious with this thing around my neck. But the, the night had slipped. Now, cracking, a couple of weeks, flat tan, out. Right. And after that, there's nobody stood with me when I was shot on the ground. I couldn't find a friend, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, I know now all of this was for my own good. It was good for me that I was afflicted, the psalmist could say, that I might know the ways of God. All this was for my good. God was breaking me down. In the pit, the devil was there. It was a good battle going on for my soul. And Jesus won the battle. Yeah. For God was in the pit with me. Yeah. Psalm 40, what is it? Psalm 40 says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, 
He heard my cry. I came to see him. He lifted me up out of a horrible pit. He lifted me up out of a horrible pit. He set my feet upon a rock. That's Jesus Christ. He established my goings and put a new song in my heart. Even praise on the Lord God. That's what he done. That's where the battle took place. That was the war zone for me. It came to a crunch. The devil was in it. I was in it. But Jesus was in it. And I won the battle for my soul. Amen. You know, uh, afterwards, you know, when the light came on, amazing grace, I speak the sound, and see the rats had me. I once was lost. Yes, and very good. But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Only by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God. You know, they would say if there was, you know, there's still problems in the world. The Lord took me to every place for three months. I began to pray these and began to pray the word, began to learn how to pray. And I had to go and see people and declare my, my case to them. The Lord was with me and delivered me from it all. It was then that the joy of the Lord came upon me. For the first time in my life, I knew what joy was. I was always ducking and diving, looking like a meerkat, <laughs> you know, hopping around corners, looking under cars, you know, like well, no one was But that was the start of my salvation. That was the start of my journey with the Lord. You know, I was next seen. Holy day in a shackle down in the wee church bus. Clacking the elderly people and taking the church. Serving the Lord. Doing that five times a week. Turning on the gas. Didn't care about them. I was free from them. I was free from it all. The Lord had set me free. The chains had fell off. And that's, I was so glad. I started to be praise team me in Bonegar and by Shay, by Paul. And the wee church as well, we used to have piano. So we used to have a guitar in the house, we were learning it, play a few chords. And we started to be praised, it was probably successful, we had spark moves, and the church became lively. It was some lovely times. I loved the prayer meetings on that Thursday night, I loved them. I loved them when the Spirit of God came. And the meetings, you felt the hush. Every month, there was a hush, you know, and the only spirits come. The messages in tongues and interpretation of the messages in tongues. That was absolutely mind blowing to me. That this God who would save me, give me his word, give me a spur, but also take time to talk to me personally. And every time he came, I started to cry. I felt his presence. He was just basically telling me everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. And it has been, <laughs> you know. But we do go back through battles. But uh, me and Bo Nard and the rest of us be as part of it now. He's, he's, he's testifying and all. He's only a new Christian two years. Amazing. Took me away to find my feet. But we've been many, many places serving the Lord. We've been many hospitals praying for the sick. Yep. Many people's homes praying for them. And we don't count, but we've led many people to the Lord. Yeah. And that's every time I serve the Lord, no matter where it's here tonight, we we'll always walk away feeling blessed that we've served the Lord. Because that's what it's all about. But if only one life will soon be passed, and that's true. That's only what's done for Christ that will last. So that's how we ministry is is hard me in Bone Yard and Big Shoe and other ones doing. And it's our honour and privilege to do it because we understand and we know it was pain and sweat. Only passing through this over. Only passing through. Cut your eyes open to the word and the things of the word. The word that I once knew faded away a long time ago. But there's no, no lure for me anymore, the word. It's only temporary. You see, there's pleasure in sin. But. There's a massive but the ways of son's death. Plus it'll bring you to hell I said to Jesus. But the gift of the gift of God is eternal life. 
So I knew it was hell bound and I knew it was earth hell for the life I've lived because at one point it's, uh, the devil and man were also had said to me, you couldn't go to court a man like you, you like for your blood, you couldn't go to court and I believe that. But God turns no one away, no matter how they're sent. The vast offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus of pardon receives. That's myself. The chief of sinners among many groups, you know. So what is Jesus to me? He's everything. I need him every day, I need him every hour of every day. I dare not go without him. I dare not go without him. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name. You know, so just a, a thank God for Jesus. I really do. Well, without him, I'd be having to come. I thank God I have a testimony. I thank God for that. I thank God for Jesus. And I'm just weighing this up. He is my all in all, my comforter, my counselor, my provider, my protector, my healer, my, my helper. And I could have filled another page with that. It goes on and on. It's blessings with me every day. You know, can't even number now. So, just thanks for that from the church. And for those that aren't seeing it, they just urge you. Just like the man that says, he says, I was at a church one night. And I got convinced to give Jesus a try. He says, now it's 50 years ago, I'm still giving him a try. I hope somebody gives him a try tonight. He will not disappoint you. He's fearful and he's lovely. Amen. 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 Thanks very much, guys. We're slightly over. But, you know what, it's always good to hear what Jesus is doing in people's lives. And particularly on Resurrection Sunday, you know, you know we're talking about Jesus being alive. Well, you're hearing it here for, 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 for real tonight, from real people. Let me read something to you very, very quickly. I'm only going to take a few moments to speak to you. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes this. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Ah, I don't believe that is nonsense, resurrection from the dead. That's the sort of thing they were saying. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ and Jesus himself is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is absolutely futile and you are still dead in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, they have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. On Resurrection Sunday, Christians all over the world celebrate the truth that Jesus Christ is is alive. We've heard tonight from these men that Jesus is alive. He's not a figment of their imagination. Yeah. A figment of their imagination didn't change their lives. The living Jesus changed their lives. God the Father who so loved us sent his son Jesus into this world to die on our behalf to pay the price for our sin, for our rebellion against him, for our transgression of his holy law. No mere man could pay the price for sin because we are all sinners. And so a sinless saviour was needed and that sinless saviour was Jesus who is God in the flesh. God himself came into the world to rescue sinners. God himself allowed himself to be crucified, to die, to have his body wrapped in linen and to be laid in a tomb. Christians believe what the word of God teaches, that on the third day, Jesus 
by the power of the Holy Spirit rose again from the dead. By his selfless, sinless sacrifice for us, Jesus paid the price for our sin. He paid the debt for our sin in full, opening up the way for sinners to be reconciled with God. By his death and his resurrection, Jesus has defeated death for everyone who will put their trust in him. Listen to, listen to me to this evening. You're going to finish up in Clandy Boy or Rosemont or wherever it is is the closest place for you. You're going to finish up in one or the other. But if you trust in Jesus, death has been defeated Amen. for you. When Jesus returns, it will be destroyed. One day soon, when he comes back for those who have trusted in him, Jesus will utterly destroy death. Death will be no more. So, very briefly, you've heard tonight from B.A. and from Tommy, you've heard them declare that they have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus rescued them. In whatever condition they were in, they both knew uh, the traumas that they had been through, they knew the way their life was, and they knew that it was Jesus who gave them life. They've been converted as we teach here in Shiloh. They've been justified. They've been accepted into God's family. They've been sanctified and they have been glorified. They're not perfect yet, but there is a day coming when they shall be made perfect because of Jesus. But all of these truths rest on one very important question and it is this. Is Jesus risen from the dead? Is he risen from the dead? Now let me ask you to answer this question. And don't say it out loud. You're likely to get a dig in the bake if you got the answer wrong. <laughs> and I don't want to get a dig in the bake when I ask it. Yes. But let me ask you this question. I want you to ask and answer it in your own heart truthfully. Are Tommy and Stephen, B.A. and Boneyard, who you can test about almost dying there with COVID, are these men just three sad individuals who spend their lives going around filling your head full of sweetie mice about this figment of their imagination called Jesus? Are they just three sad men more to be pitied than to be taken seriously? More to be pitied than to be laughed at? More to be pitied than mocked? Or scorned. In fact, are all Christians more to be pitied than taken seriously, laughed at, mocked, or scorned? God's word tells us if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then Christians are the most pitiable people on the planet. Do you hear that? If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then we're a bunch of sad kids. That's the reality. Because if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then what we believe is completely in vain. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then he himself is still dead. And all who have hoped in him for resurrection from the dead will not be raised to life. Let me ask you tonight, did you have a Christian mother and she's died? Did you have a Christian father and he's dead? Do you have a Christian brother, a sister, a son or daughter that died believing in Jesus? If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then they have perished forever. On this Resurrection Sunday, God's word absolutely assures us that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is risen from the dead. Mary Magdalene saw him. His disciples saw him. Over 500 different people saw Jesus risen from the dead. Many people down through the generations, down through the centuries, testify to the fact that Jesus is alive and has changed their lives, has transformed their lives. He is the risen Savior. He is the risen Savior still today. Even tonight, Tommy and Stephen have declared that Jesus is alive and how he has changed their lives. And I have to say, listening to other people's testimonies, isn't it wonderful what Jesus can do? Well, let me put it to you this way tonight, Christian. Christians 
That is, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have acknowledged their sin, who have confessed their sin to God, Lord, you're right, I'm a sinner. I've lived my life in a wrong and sinful way. Those who have acknowledged their sin, who have repented, who have turned away from their sin and turned to God, trusting in Jesus and in Jesus alone for salvation, it is these people. These people are not the most pitiable people on the planet because their hope is 100% sure. You know why? Because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand and Jesus has promised he's coming back soon to gather on to himself those that are his. So they're not the most pitiable people on the planet. The most pitiable people on the planet are those who are not Christians. Because they are without Jesus. This is what the Bible says. They are without Jesus. They are without God. They are without hope in this world. And they are without hope of heaven should they die in that state. This is what the word of God says. But God's good news, God's good news on this resurrection day is Jesus is alive. And by his death and resurrection, he has came in God. If you are not a Christian tonight, listen to this. Jesus has paid your debt in full tonight. The price for all of your sin is paid so that you tonight can be forgiven. So that you tonight can have everlasting life through faith in Jesus. And the same Jesus that cha is changing EA's life, is changing Thomas, is changing Boneyards, is changing mine and every other Christian. This same living Jesus is promising you tonight everlasting life if you will put your hope and your trust in him. So will you do that tonight? Will you put your trust in the risen Savior Jesus? Will you receive his salvation? Let me make it clear. If you reject Jesus, then you reject the only way to be saved from hell. There is no other way. If you reject Jesus, you reject the only way to be saved from hell. And in this life, you will be among those who are the most pitied. Because in the end, without Jesus, it would truly be better that you had never been born at all. Because you will end up in hell. But the Bible tonight tells you, when you already think said it, someone mentioned it, but Tommy, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he says, whoever comes to me, I will in no way turn away. I will not cast them out. If you come to Jesus tonight, you will receive forgiveness for all of your sins. You will receive everlasting life. You will be filled with his Holy Spirit. And you will be able to testify of what a wonderful Savior is Jesus. What a wonderful, risen, conquering King that we serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for Stephen and Tommy's testimonies, Lord, we thank you for Thomas coming down with them and just their sharing here the evening of your grace and your mercies toward them. Lord, none of us deserve to live, and yet, Lord, you give us life. Even, Lord, upon the wicked, you cause your sun and your rain to fall, Lord God. You cause your sun to shine and your rain to fall upon the just and the unjust because you're gracious, because you're merciful. But Lord, you're a God who is reaching out to us all, wanting to rescue us, wanting to save us through faith in Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who have taken hold of that good news, who have made it our own, we thank you tonight on Resurrection Day. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that we have found in him, for the hope that we have found in him, that hope which surpasses death. And Lord, we ask as born-again Christians that you would help us to continue to live for the glory of Jesus Christ, your son. Lord, we are not the most pitiable people on the planet. We are those, Lord God, who have abundant life. We are those who are filled with the joy of the Lord because we have been adopted into your family. 
But Lord, I pray tonight for anyone who's not a Christian. I ask you, please, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, that the testimonies that have been given, that the Spirit of the Lord will use these, that he will use the Word of God tonight to speak into people's lives of their need to be saved, that they would come to Jesus tonight and that they would find salvation in his glorious name. Lord, please, don't let anyone leave this place. Don't let them switch off Facebook tonight without making their peace yes. with God Amen. through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For we ask this in his glorious name. Amen. 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 Well, stand the same last song.